Twitter and similar social media platforms are toxic environments. Mass shootings and stabbings are bad. Almost no one believes that Jeffrey Epstein just committed suicide. Impeachment hearings are still proceeding. The Democrat primary season is turning into a real three-ring circus. The economy is on the rocks. Water is wet. Now that we've covered the obvious, why don't we get into why some of these things are true? It's time for some Roasted Opinions. The sensation of feeling wet comes from the interaction of liquid water and the skin through surface tension. Just kidding, folks. I'm not going to dig into the science of water here. What I am going to do is talk about mass attacks, the Epstein situation, the impeachment process, and how social media is influencing all of them negatively. Along the way, we might discover some possible solutions, but that remains to be seen. Let's start with the obvious problems. Mass attacks seem to be on the rise in the United States. As always, these attacks are being perpetrated with marginalized individuals. Despite these attacks being blamed on everything from video games to toxic masculinity to a lack of treatment for mental illness, the only thing that psychologists and law enforcement seem to be able to agree upon is that there is no one predictor for anyone to commit mass violence. Since this is true, there can be no simple solution to the problem either. The belief that it's down to too many guns only applies to mass shootings. Take away the guns, something that's unlikely to happen in the United States given the debate over the Second Amendment, and mass shootings do go down, but mass stabbings, acid attacks, and other methods of committing mass violence pick up. It's gotten so bad in the United Kingdom that laws have been enacted to deny people the ability to buy kitchen utensils without question. Thus, this cannot be the solution. A better solution is to be able to prevent the crimes before they happen. But this proposal breaks down because not even extensive studies can agree upon the cause of mass violence, much less convince anyone else of their findings. Despite research disproving the link between video games and violent acts, video games are still being blamed by some, including the president. Claims that toxic masculinity cause mass violence are disputed by researchers who cannot agree if toxic masculinity exists and denied loudly by men's rights groups who reject the notion that masculinity can be toxic. Mental health and wellness likewise aren't reliable indicators as the first sign that mental illness exists in far too many of these cases is when someone snaps and grabs a gun. I personally think that extreme stress is a more accurate predictor, and extreme stress shows up more in the changes that occur in people's social interaction. Someone who is normally active, friendly, and moderate in social settings suddenly becoming withdrawn should be a warning sign. Someone who is normally shy and reserved suddenly becoming combative is another. Many of the attacks can be linked to extremist behavior, but even in that instance, there is no universal standard for what kind of behaviors are too extreme nor when they might indicate a shift towards violent behavior. Now, on a seemingly unrelated note, Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his cell, the victim of an apparent suicide. Very few people, if anyone at all, will mourn the passing of this convicted pedophile. But there will still be many regrets, even amongst those who believe dying in prison was a fitting end for him. Now that Epstein is dead, he cannot name names anymore, and he cultivated a culture of blackmail through the lists of names of his known associates. That list, whether any similar behavior to Epstein's is proven or unproven, spans dozens if not hundreds of prominent names. Epstein moved in the level of society where the rich and powerful dwell and do business, with lots of important people. With his death, we may never know which of those movers and shakers were also pedophiles. What we do know is that if anyone wants to hurl accusations and hatred at their favorite boogeyman, well, there's an association with Epstein somewhere. Epstein struck me as a pure narcissist and sociopath, to be quite honest. He was careful to cultivate associations in order to insulate himself from prosecution, and quite successfully. How many other convicted pedophiles do you know of who served their sentences on work release, after all? The list of people who may have benefited from his demise is long, which is why almost no one accepts that he committed suicide while in a jail cell. There are too many coincidences. I think, though, that this might be exactly what happened. 
Epstein insulated himself from the consequences by making his prosecution the tip of a rather large iceberg of investigations. I can see someone with his narcissism and sociopathic tendencies hanging himself when he did because it would maximize the number of people whose reputations were tarnished, even ruined outright, and because killing himself doesn't allow his victims the bittersweet victory of watching him and those who joined him in his sexual predation be taken down. In the limited set of options which Epstein had, this choice was the one most likely to give him a sense of control over his own life and the lives of many others, and his crimes indicate that Epstein reveled in controlling others for his own benefit. What concerns me more than his death is that it was possible for him to die in this way while in custody. Why in God's name wasn't he watched? He'd already attempted suicide once. How many crimes does his death cover up? Who benefits? It's the start of every investigation. The House Judiciary Committee is proceeding with impeachment hearings and may vote out articles of impeachment. To be quite honest, the impeachment hearings are based on scant evidence of any possible criminal misconduct. Every source or potential source of evidence against the president is tainted by the extensive number of questionable people involved and the patently partisan politics which Washington is playing lately. What's more, even the Speaker of the House knows this and has attempted to shut down the investigation before it gets started. The only reason to force through a formal impeachment investigation right before a general election is to affect that election. Impeaching someone during the primary season doesn't change much of anything. So why do it? Maybe that reason has something to do with the dozens of major candidates running for the Democrat nomination. Although there are some frontrunners, and several who are polling below the margin of error, no one has truly pulled ahead of the rest of the pack. Uncle Joe Biden is showing his age with gaff after gaff. Kamala Harris was hurt by some pointed questions during the first two debates. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are neck and neck in their race to appeal to socialists. Everyone else is trailing behind those four, and the ones who seem to hold the most moderate positions are solidly in the single digits in the polls. They've wandered around the Iowa State Fair, trying to impress the crowds with their acumen and grassroots charm, taking off their ties, rolling up their sleeves, and donning blue jeans as if Iowans cannot see that this is just another fake Reagan routine. They mostly don't have the advantage that Reagan had, having never lived and worked in Iowa as he did. Iowa may have a large population of farmers, but even Iowa farmers discuss politics at the local cafe and can see right through such fakery. The results of the caucuses in January will tell the tale, and once again I thank my friends and former neighbors in my native state for vetting out the worst of the candidates every four years. Some of the candidates are starting to drop out, and the rest of the nation should be glad that the field is finally narrowing down. The stock market has taken a nasty downturn too. Go figure, the media has been talking up every indication of recession that they can. Why? Is it because they are truly worried about the state of the economy, or is it because a strong economy favors the incumbent? I watch the markets pretty closely myself, and I read the market news every day. I may stop doing that, though, if I read another, We're all gonna die! from the legacy media. Brexit will destroy the UK! The trade war with China will destroy the US! The global markets are collapsing because of the bad orange man and his Brexiteer allies! Now here's an idea. Take a look for yourself at the balance of global trade in the 10 years before 2017. Look at how long Germany and France have been forcing their banks to buy bonds at negative yield rates in order to bolster their economy through quantitative easing. Look how long China has been manipulating the value of the yuan by setting the trade threshold to keep its value weak. And remember that when you look at that figure that a weak currency favors exports from that country, while a strong currency favors imports to that country. Don't believe me? Look at how weak the yuan is compared to the dollar and compare it to the growth of the U.S.-China trade deficit. Compare how the exchange rates between the pound sterling and the euro follow the same pattern regarding the U.K.-EU trade deficit. Quantitative easing devalues currency and the euro, which was designed to be strong in the first place, has weakened against both the pound and the U.S. dollar for years. The yuan, typically a weak currency, has been further weakening despite GDP growth in China, which outstrips much of the rest of the world. 
when GDP growth is approaching double digits as an annualized figure, the currency of that country should actually become stronger. Now couple the currency actions of the EU and China with their other actions, systematically reassigning the resource rights of the UK to other member nations, refusing to entertain a reasonable deal for Brexit in order to attempt to force the UK to rescind the Article 50 notice, the outrageous attempts by China to corner the market on manufacturing, their deceptive trade practices and dumping of commodities in order to force competition out of business, the ridiculous rules regarding tech transfers which, coupled with their already strong position in tech manufacturing due to their rare earth element resources, could easily leave them in a world-dominating position regarding tech. There's nothing mutually beneficial about these actions by the EU and China, and if trade isn't mutually beneficial, it goes off the rails and throws the economy into a recession. That's why so many people don't want to see a globalized economy. For those of us who oppose globalization, globalization is to economies as monopolies are to companies. We don't want to see the EU fail, nor do we want to see the Chinese economy collapse. What we want is a fair and equitable trade arrangement, where both sides benefit. Such arrangements lead to expansion for everyone's economy as more people move into businesses which import and export goods and services. I know, I know. But Rose, orange man bad. Silly hair man bad. Keep saying that, but repetition won't make it an accurate statement. Now, where do social media platforms come into play in all of this? Well, social media is not reality. It's not real life, but more and more people are starting to assume that what happens on social media platforms like Twitter is real life. And when you have that sort of radical behavior, divorced from normal social mores that would apply in real life, you have the potential for people to become a lot more radical than they would otherwise. It doesn't have to be an organized radicalization. People can adopt extremist ideas without any deliberate recruiting attempt by another group. They simply associate with groups of people who share some of their ideas and then engage in discussions in which more radical ideas are introduced and eventually adopted. The social groups that people are forming on social media platforms are taking the place, in some instances, of the social groups that they would have in real life. Their socialization is only happening on social media, where we all know the rules of real life don't necessarily apply. If somebody becomes convinced that what goes on on social media is real life, then I think you can see where the disconnect would come into place and the cultural divides would seem much broader than they actually are. Perhaps we all need to take a look at what behavioral norms are going to be considered permissible on social media platforms. Not that I advocate any sort of censorship, but I certainly advocate everybody taking a look at their own behaviors and asking themselves, would I do this in real life to somebody's face? If you wouldn't, then why would you do it on social media? I don't know. Maybe thinking about it that way will get us to all take a deep breath and calm down the rhetoric that we're seeing on these platforms. Then again, maybe it won't. Maybe social media platforms have become our new reality. And if that's true, I really don't see how we are going to manage to come together, discuss the real problems that our societies have, and foster solutions which everyone can accept.